I, I've had, uh, the, you know, the past uh, six years, I've had some serious illnesses, but I, it never entered my mind. As long as my mind is clear, and it would have to be to ask for uh, a physician to assess in ending my life, uh, so I can't think of a single situation at this point. I There's nothing in my mind. I've had pain ever since the accident. I've had six spinal surgeries and three on the esophagus. And um, I've had, I'm, I'm never without pain. I wake up with it, I go to bed with it. But that's just not crossed my mind. Does somebody have the right to die? I think if, if it's beyond hope, absolutely. I think that God gave us life, and it's up to God to, to take the life when he's ready. We don't know what plans he has for us. Um, so we might be cutting his plans short when we take her, if we would take her alive. Euthanasia uh, is a word taken from the Greek word for good death. Uh, I believe it was first coined by the philosopher Francis Bacon in the early 17th century. In today's world, it usually refers to either physician-assisted suicide or actual mercy killing, what's sometimes called voluntary euthanasia. The story of the struggle over euthanasia as a policy reform may just be the most contentious and divisive debate America has been engaged in over the last 100 years. To me, euthanasia means uh, a active intervention uh, by a physician or by a practitioner uh, to enable someone uh, to die. Euthanasia, uh, really coming from the words that would mean uh, a good death, and uh, there's really no such thing as a good death. For someone to take the life of another uh, really would go back to uh, the Old Testament scripture, thou shalt not kill. So to euthanize or to take someone else's life for less suffering would not be appropriate. Euthanasia would be terminating somebody's life before it would naturally terminate. Ending one's pain and suffering in, in a uh, humane manner uh, is my definition of euthanasia. While there is a great deal of sympathy for dying people who have to suffer from terrible pain and loss of dignity and autonomy, and surprising toleration for those who are periodically prosecuted for performing euthanasia, there's a declining belief that the remedy for this unhappy state of affairs is the enactment of euthanasia laws. I think every individual has the right to determine uh, when their time uh, to pass on has arrived. Um, I don't think the physician-assisted suicide uh, should encourage death, but at the same time, I think it should be a means by which patients can properly end their life when they've reached the point where they're either terminal or uh, medical science has nothing further to offer and they're in intractable pain and suffering and under those circumstances uh, I think it would be uh, reasonable for a physician to assist in such a, such a thing. And generally I don't believe in assisted suicide. However, if I am relieving their suffering and that leads to their death, I would agree with that. As long as the, as the intention is to relieve pain, I think that, uh, that, uh, that that's um, uh, an understandable course of action for a physician to take in palliative care. When, when I counsel people who are terminally ill and uh, they're ready to refuse all, um, all nutrition, um, there's nothing wrong with them doing that. Uh, they can make that decision and they can die naturally and hopefully with the help of hospice 
uh, their death can be dignified and, and, um, and, uh, and relatively free of pain. Uh, that's different than asking someone to, uh, to cause their death. And um, in the Jewish context, that would be forbidden. And I think personally, I would also have trouble with that concept of it. actually having another person cause a person to die, uh, even if it was done out of the motives for mercy. But the Christian attitude is to preserve life, to enable life. Uh, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Uh, so the Christian attitude it would be to live life to the fullest, which obviously couldn't be uh, helped by suicide. Garner media coverage by performing a sensationalist act was the notorious Dr. Death himself, Jack Kevorkian. Kevorkian had been an obscure pathologist with a ghoulish fascination for morbid topics when, in 1990, he rose to national prominence for helping Janet Atkins die. Over the next eight years, Kevorkian helped at least 93 other people die. 63 of them, incidentally, were women. But three different juries refused to indict him. Nor was Kevorkian all that familiar with his patients' clinical histories. To Kevorkian, these were unimportant issues. He strongly advocated euthanasia on demand without governmental regulation for whoever requests it. To him, it's a matter of personal autonomy, pure and simple. They were all terminal, and before he administered, he first got all the medical records and then met with the entire family. If anybody objected in the family, it didn't go forward. And he took a couple few weeks, of the, as long as he could, for them to reconsider, for them to be informed. And then, in any case he thought it might have been depression or any instance that it could be even suggested, he sent them to psychiatrists or got psych psychiatric evaluations. Ten years ago, things looked a lot rosier, of course, the Oregon law had been enacted. Uh, there were several cases winding their way to the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, uh, which uh, many uh, legal observers felt uh, would uh, stood a good chance of, of being uh, victorious. Uh, and of course, in, the, in 1997, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, did rule that there was no constitutional right to die. Uh, so that was a major defeat for the euthanasia movement. And since then, various referenda in v different states have failed to match the Oregon victory. It allows a person to take their own life but they have to take their own and the doctor just gives them the pills and leaves. Now, if there's any complications or problems, uh, a doctor isn't there in attendance. That's different than it is in Holland, where the doctor, of course, is in attendance and uh, assists. Because really, it's, as I said before, it's a medical procedure and should be handled by doctors and not the person doing it to themselves or somebody else doing it to them. When we trained to be physicians, we're trained to uh, heal and, and, and treat. Uh, we're not trained to assist in, in suicide or promote death. Uh, and unfortunately, death is a part of life. And uh, everyone uh, who's reached the point of their life where they're suffering or they're uh, terminal, those individuals should have the right to end their life when they feel it's time. The history of euthanasia in America suggests this is a simplistic diagnosis of a gravely complex social, political, economic, and cultural matter. Talk of a right to die raises the troubling questions. Once legalized for the dying, who can be denied such a right? Chronically ill but not dying? Pain-free patients who nonetheless feel their medical conditions leave them with no quality of life? Depressed teenagers? The mentally ill? Handicapped children whose parents wish them dead? Infants 
with severe disabilities, where does the freedom to die end and the duty to die begin? The history of euthanasia in America reminds us that despite a century of intensive debate and passionate political battles, these questions remain largely unanswered.